But uh, I'm excited about the Word today, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand to your feet as we get into the Word. Today we're going to read not the whole story, but a major portion of a story that you probably feel like you know pretty well, Uh, one that we probably were introduced to the first few times we went to Sunday school when we were children. But I believe there are some things in this story that uh, the Lord wants to emphasize to us this week and might be a few things in there that we haven't seen before. And so I want to encourage you just to uh, read along and honor God's word with me as we go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read several verses there beginning with verse 43. You'll recognize this is the story of David and Goliath. Verse 43, And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that you comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day the Lord will deliver into mine hand And I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, For the battle is the Lord's. I want you to say that with me. The battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. (laughs) And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him and there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran. Notice he he never stopped. He never stopped approaching he he ran and stood upon the philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith and when the philistines saw that their champion was dead they fled and the men of israel and judah arose and shouted and pursued the philistines until they come to the valley and to the gates of ekron And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharaim, even unto Gath and Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, Whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Well, inquire thou whose son this stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David said, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. I want to read just one verse to you from James, the fourth chapter, verse 7. It says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, 
and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Would you bow with me for prayer? Father, we stand in your presence today thankful for your holy word. Thank you, Father, that it is alive and active and it's working in our lives today. And, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is moving among us here today. We ask you, Lord, to anoint me to bring the word, anoint the hearers that they might hear and receive and respond to your word in faith. Lord, I thank you for what you've purposed to do here today. And, Lord, we say we're in agreement. We're on board with what you know that needs to be done today. We ask you to have your way in our midst, in every heart, in every life. And when we're done today, Father, may your will have been done and you receive all the praise and glory. And all the people said together, Amen. And you can be seated. Well, I titled today's message a couple things before I landed, but I just finally landed on calling this Battle Lines. We're going to talk about some battle lines today. But before we get directly into the context of the passage that uh, we have read, I want us to acknowledge some things here today. Just This has to do with the mentality that we must have as Christians, as believers. And I'm going to use the terminology that the only other time I remember hearing it much is in free camp. But in free camp with our workers, we have some people that Sharon classifies as movers and shakers. Church, that should be our mindset every day that we live, that we're movers and shakers in the kingdom of God. We're not campers and settlers. We're movers and shakers. That's what God has called us to. You see, we got to understand that when we come to Jesus and make Him Savior and Lord, it's because He called us out of some low things and He's calling us up to some higher things. Folks, I want you to recognize today God has called you to some higher things than what you experienced before you knew Him. He's called you to some higher things than what you have walked in thus far. He is calling us up higher. Now, we all know that we all have a promised land. Eventually, we're, you know, in heaven, a place that God has prepared for us. And I think sometimes Christians get sort of mixed up and they, they think that's all the promised land there is. But I can't read the Bible and see that. I mean, Abraham and me and you, God said, I'm going to take you somewhere. There are promised lands for you and I to explore and to possess. Things that God has ordained that He would bring us to to accomplish for His praise and to His glory. That's true of every child of God. The, the wrong mentality for us to get is is for us to think that we just got saved and now we're just going to kind of just sort of set it out till Jesus comes or calls for us. The Word of God declares that we are called to possess the land, to have dominion. We're going to talk about that word just a little bit later on, but I'm just going to throw it out at you now and let it soak a little bit. God has called you and I to possess the land and to have dominion. You should read the first chapter of Genesis and see what God's plan was and what he put within the grasp of man. Now, we all know that Adam kind of blew it there and lost some stuff, but we got it back in Jesus. Amen? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But I want us to understand that 
the will of God is that we recognize what it means for us to walk in covenant relationship and covenant communion with God Himself. And I want to declare to you that it is the will of God for every child of God that we experience a victorious, overcoming, joy-filled life. I'm going to say that again. Keith's not here in the morning. He's out here working somewhere, but he's not here to prompt me to say that again. But I'm going to say it is the will of God for every child of God to experience a victorious, overcoming, joy-filled life. The old saints used to sing a song. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's the will of God. Now the Bible says, not just to the preachers, not just to the missionaries, not just to the apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, but to every child of God, that we are a gifted people and a called out people. Can you say amen? amen. When you got saved, the Lord gave you not only a measure of faith, but He deposited in you or He, he made alive in you the gifts and the callings that He had ordained would be a part of your life from the foundation for the very before you were even born. And um, your life has a unique purpose and a unique destiny. Don't ever doubt that. You're here for a reason. You woke up today. You're, God still got you around. I, I saw a picture on Facebook yesterday. A, a guy that drives a tow truck around here put a picture of a, a big Dodge pickup truck that it just looked like a, a mangled ball of metal you couldn't even recognize what kind of truck it was and he had loaded it up on the interstate and he said he was standing there talking to the guy that drove it and he asked him did you pray today have you prayed since you got out of there because apparently god's not done with that guy but every day you and i wake up and see the light of day we should understand god's plans and god's purposes for my life have not been completed. He's still got his hand on me. He's still calling me to something great today. And by faith, I am going to pursue what it is that he's called me to. I said you are called and gifted with a unique purpose and destiny. And like the song says, the God that we serve in this great big world, he has his eye on the sparrow, but you can rest assured that he watches very intently your life. Be encouraged by that today. Now something, as we begin to move a little closer to our story here, that I see very often the story speaks of it, is that just as soon as you and I embrace the truth that I've introduced this message with today, I mean, I, I felt like I was kind of pulling y'all, pulling you in. I'm pulling you in. I'm, I'm, we're getting on the same page for where we're going. But, but life and even this story illustrates that just as soon as we begin to embrace those truths, we notice that we encounter some obstacles. We encounter some resistance. We encounter warfare that is very similar to what we saw in the story today. Are you going somewhere in life? Are you pursuing a calling, a purpose, a destiny? Have you settled down somewhere? Have you, maybe you, like some Christians, have sort of sought out a, a safe space. I, I want to be saved. I want to know that I'm going to heaven, but I really don't want to stir up too much. A, a lot of Christians kind of, I believe, kind of operate there. You can't win there. But in this story, we see that the people of God were going somewhere, but they encountered a barrier. 
There is an enemy that is impeding their progress. And something I just want to to tell you that you can always count on this morning is that if you're going to move forward in the things of God, and I want to believe everybody here is purposing today that by faith you're going to, you wouldn't be here this morning. You'd be on the lake somewhere or at the beach somewhere or doing something else if you weren't on this mindset. But if you're going to move forward with the things of God, understand something today. You are going to have to go through and over top of the devil to get there. Now somebody in here thought, well, that wasn't such great good news, but it's okay. I mean, it's the truth. It gets gooder as we go along. But you're going to have to go over top of the devil to get to where God's called you to. As a matter of fact, the place for him, the Bible says, is under your feet anyway. Your heel's supposed to be on his head. So don't get the notion that your Christian life is going to allow you to avoid the devil. If anything, you're going to have to deal with him more often and more fiercely as a Christian than you ever did before you were saved. He didn't have to oppose you when you were walking with him. He wasn't going to make it hard on you then. Uh, As a matter of fact, he wanted to make you think in those days that he was your friend. He wanted to make you think that living the life that he would lead you to was the way to have a life of ease. And the truth is, it is the course of least resistance. The only thing is, if you keep flowing with it, you just flow right over the edge somewhere. So you're going to have to encounter the devil, and you're going to have to get to the place where it doesn't surprise you You're going to have to get to the place that it doesn't alarm you. You're going to have to get to the place that it doesn't throw you in a panic when you encounter the devil. And that's what the Lord's going to help us with today. This story goes that the armies of Israel had been faced off with the Philistines and the battle was in array. Yeah, there's going to be a fight. You have to learn to be a winner There's only two options. Learn to be a winner or concede to be beaten. But there's going to be a battle. The Bible says that there was two armies. The Philistines on one mountain. Armies of Israel on the other mountain. A valley in between. They were faced off. But the battle took place in the valley. Isn't it something... That it seems like it's always in the valley where we fight the battle. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you could fight the battles of your life on the mountaintops, on the high tops, on the high points of your Christian experience? Don't We always tend to feel, I don't know about you, but I always tend to feel like, you know, When I'm in the valley, I always tend to feel like, man, I don't know if I'm up to this one or not today. But now you get me and I go right out of church this morning and it's like, man, I'm ready. The devil always tries to get you in the valley. The truth is there's a lot of valleys in the Christian life that we've got to get through. But I, I, I just want to speak the truth to you. The God that's God on the mountain is God in the valley. He said we could walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil for he's with us. His rod and his staff would comfort us. He, the Lord is our shepherd and he's there with us. In the valley as well. Now, something I I want you to to get, and you've got to keep this in your mind when it comes to fighting the battles of your life. 
in this story and in your story, the people of God are already winners. You got to fight the battle, but you're already a winner. You know, it makes a big difference in a battle if you know you're the winner. It makes a big difference in anything you set out to do if you already know you're the winner. I mean, you know, if the Lord's on our side, of whom shall we be afraid? Of whom shall we fear? We're going to come back to that a little bit later. But I want you to see the tactic of the enemy in this story. See, the Philistines had this giant warrior. I mean, he really was a giant. His name is Goliath. And he was big and he was bad. And one of the biggest things on him was his mouth. And Goliath came out and thundered across the valley with a threat to the people of God. Hey, child of God, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a threat come to your life? Something that you didn't see coming and all of a sudden, boom, sort of blindsided you, almost knocked your feet out from under you. Goliath thundered across the valley with a threat and he wanted every soldier of the people of God to envision himself fighting against Goliath standing alone. Send a man! If you got any men over there that can deal with a real man, send him on out here. And we're going to let the winner of this battle is going to determine who's going to serve who. If you got anybody who can stand against me, send him on. He looked bad. He sounded bad. He seemed invincible. His whole strategy, though, same strategy the devil uses against me and you. His whole strategy was intimidation. Wonder, is it any wonder why God says over and over and over in the Word of God? When he called Joshua, I think it's in that one chapter. He said over and over, do not fear, be of good courage, fear not. Throughout the word of God, God is constantly telling me and you, do not be afraid, fear not, be of good courage. Because the devil's main tactic is intimidation and getting your eyes off of God and onto Him. Your eyes off of what God has said. Your eyes off of the promise of God. Your faithful God that will never leave you nor forsake you. He wants to pull your focus off of Him and on to what He is saying. The first time he did this, the men of Israel just about went into shock. I mean, they went back and didn't even sleep at night. All night, they were out there talking about, man, did you see that giant? Did you see that arm? Did you see that spear? Did you hear his voice? Who among us? Who among us would dare go out and fight for us? What are we going to do? And they fretted all night long until the next day when Goliath comes out and thunders across the valley with the same words. And he did it every day for 40 days. Can I tell you that's another one of the devil's tricks? His tactic against you and I is to wear us down. 
He came every day with the same thing. He didn't have anything to back it up, but he came every day. And he came every day. And the people of God heard it every day for 40 days. Let me ask you something. What has the enemy hit you with lately that you know is uh, you know it's not God, you know it's the enemy? What has he taunted you with that every day that you live, he's putting it in your face? Every day that you live, every day that you step out, every day that you go on to try to walk in faith and serve God, but the enemy's putting something in your face, some kind of barrier that he's created, some kind of thing that he has erected to keep you from getting from where you are to the God, to the promise that God has given your life. And every day he's saying, you'll never get there because of this. You'll never get there because of this. You might as well turn around right now. You might as well throw in the towel right now because you cannot overcome this. He taunts and he taunts and he taunts. His tactic is that he can get your vision focused frozen on the circumstances rather than on your promise and your calling. And if the enemy sees the first evidence of your timidity, he'll work that just as long as he can. If he senses discouragement, if he senses despair, he'll come just as harder and harder and harder. And so here's another one of the enemy's tactics. He begins to tell people what he's going to do to them. Has the devil ever told you something he's going to do to you? Now, I know we, we all ought to know better than listen to him anyway. Sometimes people come to me and say, oh, the old devil said this. And I say, well, why are you listening to him? You know he's a liar. But I guess we all get in situations where, you know, you, you, you have to at least process what comes. and And so... Has he ever told you what he's going to do to you? Let me give you an example. Because you're walking in faith, see? You're trying to obey God. You're trying to, to live the Word of God. You're trying to pursue the will of God. And the devil comes along and says, I tell you what, you pay your tithes this week, your family's going to get hungry before your next paycheck. If you stand up and preach that message, Pastor, half of the congregation will walk out before you get finished. Oh, you think he don't say stuff like that? Pastor, if you stand your ground on that policy, if you preach your conviction on that, they'll ask you to leave. The devil will show you the bleakest picture of what's ahead of you because that's his attack. How many times has he made you feel like, or he might whisper, I got you now. That's it. <laughs> you might as well give up because it's over. I mean, this is over with. But I want to remind you of a couple things from God's Word. Number one, the devil is a liar. He can't tell the truth. It's not in him. He has no, no place to get the truth. His stuff is so messed up and out of alignment with God. He cannot tell the truth. The second thing I want you to realize from God's Word is all He can do is threat. He can't deliver on those threats. 
Because there is a God that watches over me and you. And there are angels that are assigned to me and you. And the devil cannot go across the bloodline for the child of God. Hallelujah. I've heard Pastor Perry say frequently, we ought to be thanking God for all the stuff that the devil tried, but God wouldn't let him do. We're, we're here today. Because God willed and planned and purposed and brought us here. If the enemy had had his way, we wouldn't have made it. But in this story, the de- I mean Goliath, I'm going to f- said, I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. That's just regular old bully talk. The only way he stood a chance of doing that was if David would buy into the fear and the intimidation that he was peddling. But listen, the devil cannot get you unless he can convince you. The devil cannot get you unless he can convince you. I want to ask you, who are you listening to this morning? In the, when you're faced off at the battle, be it in the valley or wherever, who are are you listening to Goliath? Are you listening to the lying enemy? Are you listening to the word of God? Because there came a time in this story when the man of God Addressed the giant. Just like in my life and yours. Hey, if we're going to be victorious, there's a time. There is a time when we have to speak. There's a time when we have to let it be known. We have taken our stand on the word of God. We have submitted ourselves to almighty God. We are under submission, under covenant, and we are in full resistance to the devil and everything that he brings. There comes a time that that has to be. When the devil starts whispering to you what he's going to do to you, You need to start declaring to him what you're going to do to him. Do you know what? Every one of us ought to be the devil's worst nightmare. We've got this, we've had this thing all twisted up. A lot of times the church spends their time running from the devil, trying to, to stay out of trouble from getting him stirred up and, and you know, just kind of, kind of get along maybe under the radar so that, so that we don't get too much stuff from him. We ought to get up every day saying, where is that devil? I'm going to run him out of here. He's got no right, no place, no authority. Every day of our life, you and I must be on the war path. We're going to, God has called us to take dominion, to rule and to claim this area, to claim our land, to claim our inheritance and to drive the devil out by the name of Jesus. Most of us are just too passive. We just take it devil stuff. I don't know why we do that. Maybe sometimes we think it's all on us. Or maybe it's oh it's just not our time to do something or you know, maybe we've listened to enough of his stuff that we feel like we deserve some of his trash. I don't know. But I want us to understand something that David understood here. This attack was not just about David. And I want you to know that the attack of the enemy on you is not just about you. The enemy was defying the living God. He was defying the word. Now listen. 
If you're ever going to have anything that you're going to stand up for, if you're ever going to have anything that you're willing to fight for, if you ever have anything that you will not be moved off of, it should be the Word of God, the integrity of the Word of God. Now, when the devil comes to warring against me, that's one thing. But when he comes to warring against the living God, that's something altogether different. How many of you know today that the Lord God will fight for you? I want you to be convinced today that the Lord God will fight for you. I want you to say it with me. My God will fight for me. My God will fight for me. And if you don't know that, if you're not convinced about it, you just need to walk back through the Scriptures a little bit and see how many times God said that He would. He said the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. He said, why don't you just stand still, son, and see the salvation of the Lord? He said, just praise the Lord in the midnight and watch the jail doors open up. He said, just shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph and watch the walls fall down flat. He said, just don't bend, just don't bow, and just don't burn. And because there's a fourth man in the fire with you that's there to deliver you. He said, just trust God and He will shut the mouths of the lions and give you a good night's sleep if you have to use them for a pillow. Amen. How many of you here knows that God is a provider who will provide a ram in the thicket and He will make a way when there is no way? I said our God will fight for us. Hallelujah. Your battle is not over until God says it's over and He's not going to say it's over until you win. Because he's already declared you a winner. David said, you're coming out to me, Goliath, with a sword. And we're getting to this place now where God's showing us what we have to do sometime. In other words, sometimes we just have to say, devil, is that all you got? Is that lie all you got? David said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield. I got something mightier than that, Goliath. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. I believe those words were, I believe every one of those words were just, like letting all the air out of old Goliath's sail because David spoke them with confidence. He wasn't just blowing smoke. He was not just saying the right words. He believed it and he was convinced down in his heart. The name of the Lord, when he said that, I believe old Goliath went, oh. The Bible says it's a strong tower that men run into and be safe. I think those words hit Goliath like a boulder in the belly. Oh. He said, the God of the armies of Israel. And old, Elijah, old, old Goliath went, oh. You think that Philistine had not heard of the victories of Israel? You think he had not heard of the victories of Israel when they had fought against insurmountable odds? And here David is saying, the God of Israel, Goliath said, oh. The God whom thou hast defied. David said to Goliath, just like you need to say to the devil, before this is over with, you're going to know there's a God. 
before this is over with, you are going to know there is a God in Israel. I want to encourage you today. If you're in some kind of a battle, I want you to say it with me before it's over. Somebody's going to know there's a God in my situation. Amen? I want to get back to something I mentioned earlier before we close. I want you to understand that the battle, whether it was this battle in this story or the battle that you might be facing today or the battle that we might face this coming week, it really boils down to, and it's all about one thing, Understand this, it's about dominance. It's about dominance. See, this story said, hey, we're going to figure out who's going to dominate who. Somebody comes out here and beats the giant, the Philistines are going to dominate this land and this army. But if it's the other way around, whoever wins is going to do It's about dominance. Let me read to you what Webster says that means. The power or the right of governing and controlling. Hmm. You want to know what that battle you're dealing with? Oh, it's not about a few dollars. It's not about a pain in your body. It's not about this or that or the other. What the battle is really all about is the devil's trying to figure out if he can dominate you in that area. It's about your calling. It's about your destiny. It's about what God's going to use you to do. And the enemy's trying to figure out if so he can do something that's going to give him dominance in that area where you cannot pursue. Dominion, it means the right, the power or right of governing and controlling. The second definition is to rule or to control domination. The devil wants to dominate you. And what you have to understand today is that Jesus Christ purchased our liberty and our freedom and he gave you and I the dominion in Christ Jesus. The truth is we're supposed to dominate the devil. Wherever we recognize, wherever that battle, and you know, the devil, we, we think of it like this. We always think about the devil brings the battles. We need to bring the battles. We need to pick out places where it's clear that the devil is dominating, be it, be it in our family, be it in our community, be it in our nation, be it wherever, but you can see the devil is, he's ruling, he's controlling. Well, instead of us just waiting until, you know, well, if I gotta fight this battle, well, if I've gotta stand on the Word of God, well, if I've got to do something in faith, if, if, I, if I've got to be reactive to something the devil's... How about if you and I put him on the run? Yeah. Yeah. The battle is about dominance. Here's one more thing I want to show you today. As I make my way toward a closing spot here today. You're either in a battle now or you're going to be in a battle. So this, that's where this message is coming from. But I want to show you what happened when David did what God called him to do. And Goliath was beheaded. The enemy, the Philistines, they turned and fled. They ran from God's people. They ran from Israel. 
But I want to show you something. The story, here's something. I don't think I ever paid any attention to this before. The story didn't stop there. God gave the victory through this, this man that went to the battle. And the Bible says that they pursued the enemy. They pursued them until they killed the Philistines off. But you know what? They didn't even stop there. They could have jumped up and down and said, Oh, okay, well, we won the battle. Uh, we got that one over with. I guess that's that one. No, the Bible says they turned around. They went right back. And you know what they did? They spoiled the Philistines' tents and their possessions. They went and gathered up everything that the enemy had, all of their riches, all of their wealth, all of their, all of their trophies, everything else. Do you know what God has called you and I to do? We've got to get serious about taking back the territory that God says is ours. We've got to get serious about taking back the territory, folks. I mean relationships and I mean, I mean loved ones that... that you know, the Lord has promised us our houses would be saved if we serve Him. we got to get serious about going after it, taking the spoils. The thing I want to challenge us with today, the thing I believe that God would challenge us with today, let's quit turning away from the battle. Let's be a people that God has raised up that run to the battle to win the victory for the cause of Christ and to experience the victory that He has called us to and has said is already ours. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with me today. We hope this message has been a blessing to you today. When you are in our area, please consider joining us in person off exit 98 at one Harvest Place across from Walmart in Dublin.